Ladies and gentlemen, خانم ها و آقایان عزیز، سروران گرامی، خوش آمدید و صفا آوردید. How lovely to have you here on an evening where you could perhaps been having American cocktails to celebrate the Independence Day. I hope none of you, I hope none of you turn down an invitation to Winfield House. گل در بر و می در کف و معشوق بکام است. سلطان جهانم به چنین روز غلام است. Roses by my side. Wine in my hand or will be in an hour's time when we go to our reception. And beloved is in an agreeable mood. The sultan of the world is a mere slave to me on a day like this. Before we start the evening's program, I would like to thank our amazing helpers, without whom we couldn't have got this evening um, off the ground. So the usual suspects are Joe, Helen, Jonathan, both from SOAS and Parasol Unit, Richard, my colleague Kendall from BIPS, and many others whose names uh, are too long to list. But thank you to all of you. And before we get to the um, heart of the evening, I would like to invite the extraordinary dynamo, that is Dr. Ziba Ardalon, for her inspirational energy, who had the idea of giving a platform to poetry alongside her two amazing exhibitions currently taking place at Parasol Unit, not far from us, and also at Conservatory de Musica Benedetto Marcello Campo Santo Stefano, apologies to Italians for that, <laughs> in Venice as part of the Biennale. I'd like to invite Ziva John Befarman to say a few words about the Parasol Unit and the amazing exhibition she's put together, The Spark is You, which really started this journey. Good evening, everybody. It's a huge pleasure to be here, and thank you very much, Nargis John, for the kind introduction and for really contributing so much to this project of The Spark Is You. The two exhibitions that are currently taking place in Venice and in London at Parasol Unit at the Foundation, 14 Wharf Road, not far from here, uh, the whole idea of this exhibition came about um, three years ago uh, when uh, I just realized that the state of the world is the way that we need to talk. We need to be open, we need to converse, we need to be tolerant, and the world and our leaders are currently missing some of that. Uh, so. What would be the best way to do it? Uh, I turn to poetry as Iranian, and therefore the exhibition, exhibition of Persian artists, because in a way poetry is embedded in the soul of every Persian person, individual. And it happened that 2019 is also the 200th anniversary of Goethe's West Oslische Divan, which was written in homage to Hafez at a time that the rest of the world was infatuated with the idea of Orientalism, exotism of that part of the world, Goethe was telling to people to be more sophisticated and understand what is going on, Persian poetry. So that was the inspiration, and a great inspiration all along came, of course, from Nargis John, who taught me, in some ways, in a very good way, Persian again, a language I had, I'm ashamed to say, almost I had lost, forgotten. Uh, so it has been three years of extraordinary encounters with artists, experience, looking at hundreds of uh, documents, works, uh, studio visit, 
And finally, we decided to do an exhibition of nine Iranian artists in Venice and nine Iranian artists in London. And I hope you all find a way to go to Venice and or go to London, just a few uh, subway lines here and to, to see the exhibition. Uh, in Venice, it's taken place, as Nargis John said, at the Music Conservatory. The idea was to have an experience when visitors go there, to have that kind of experience between the visual art and music. There is music playing, there is singing going on, and the experience and all the emails I received from visitors, all the feedback I had, it was an amazing moment during the visit. And I really put a lot of emphasis on that. And luckily, we, our project is a collateral event going on until 23rd of November. So it has been, in the process, an incredible pleasure to have people like Nargis John around to talk and to be guided by her and others. And this event is now the sixth event which we did in conjunction with this exhibition in London. We did six events in which people, uh, Iranian actually talked about their art, film, architecture, poetry, psychoanalysis. And it was a wonderful moment and they are all on our website. They are filmed usually on our, our website and that is a special moment to see Iranian talking about their own culture. Thank you. Thank you, Zibar John. So a bit of running order to see how we're going to conduct this evening. I'm honored and blessed, truly, that I have two of my dearest oldest friends here, but that's not why I chose them. It's because that they are, they are authorities on the fields that they uh, do the research on or write about. Bruce Wannell and Sarah Stewart. Bruce and Sarah will be taking us on a journey this evening, first to explore the pre-Islamic beginnings and origins of some rituals, motifs, and images that are engraved on the cultural persona of the peoples of what we call the Persianate world and continue to inform our culture, literature, and the arts. Sarah will focus our gaze and, um, on some of the most significant figures whose names are so well known to us, but not all of us will have an in-depth knowledge of their genesis. And for some, you may not even associate them with the Persian culture. We will then move to the classical era in the company of the traveler and linguist Bruce Wannell. And we will encounter his selections of classical poetry. We will then follow the path to the modern times and conclude the evening with reciting a couple of contemporary poems and then we would like to invite you to a brief question and answer session. And of course, there will be a reception of refreshments later. So I'll start by introducing Sarah to you. Sarah Stewart is the Shapurji Palanji Senior Lecturer in Zoroastrianism in the School of History, Religions and Philosophies here at SOAS, and also co-chairs the institute that carries the same name. Sarah has written extensively on Zoroastrianism in Iran and in India. Her list of publications and research is available on the SOAS website, so I won't um, take time to read them. But her recent book, which is published just um, a month ago, is entitled Voices from Zoroastrianism, Iran, Oral Texts and Testimony. And some of you may have come to the amazing exhibition that she had at the Brunei Gallery, The Everlasting Flame, Zoroastrianism in History and Imagination. So please join me to welcome Sarah to the program. Thank 
Thank you. Thank you, Nagas, for your kind introduction. And wow, what a fantastic audience. It's not um, often I get to talk about Zoroastrianism to a full house. Um, and thank you especially to the Parasol Unit and to Dr. Zeba Adalan for bringing this event to SOAS. So as Nagas said, um, my talk's about some of the pre-Islamic, that is Zoroastrian, myths and legends and ideas that became absorbed into Persian literature. And I'm going to take some examples from the epic literature, in particular the Shahnameh, or Book of Kings, Ferdos's great epic, so beloved by Iranians around the world. It traces its origins, its genesis, to a chronicle by the same name in the Pahlavi language, the Khwadai Namag, which informed Ferdos's work. But before we go there, I want to just do a whistle-stop tour of the Zoroastrian beliefs concerning creation, for it's the story of, of creation, the fire, the plant and animal worlds that live on in the imagery of Persian poetry following the demise of Zoroastrianism in Iran. Now, you don't have to read all the labels here, but I just wanted to begin just by um, explaining that creation came about by the wise lord Ahura Mazda, the sole creator god. And he brought, he created to assist him in this seven div divine immortals, the Amish or Spenters. So we have here, um, beginning with the sky originally conceived as being of stone, water, earth, plant, cattle, man, and fire. And the world was created in, in a perfect state until the evil force, Ahriman, smashed through the sky of stone, polluted, damaged, destroyed everything. Every single aspect he spoiled. So, for example, water was pure and he made it salty. Fire was pure and he caused it to smoke. And for every single creation, he created a counter-creation. So the, the good honeybee, for example, he produced the wasp and so on. And so this is the dualism between good and evil that informs Zoroastrian doctrine and its religious texts. Now returning to the, returning to the Shahnameh, my first example is that of the first man, Geomaratan in the Old Western language, or Geomard in Pahlavi and Kiyomars in Persian. His name means mortal life, and sometimes he's literally referred to as Gea. So this is an illustrated manuscript. Um, this folio here shows, shows him um, dressed in a leopard skin, as he's often depicted, holding court in the mountains. And animals are shown sitting around at his feet. And it's said, the cattle and the diverse beasts of prey grew tame before him. And this is the actual story um, as it is in the Pahlavi um, Bundahishan, the Zoroastrian text, and I'll just read it briefly, because um, the first man was supposed to be the sixth of the creations. So it says here, sixth he fashioned Geomard, luminous like the sun. He measured four spears in height, his width equal to his height, on the shore of the river Deity, where the middle of the world is. Geomard on the left, the bull on the right. To help him, he gave him sleep, the relaxation of the creator, for Ormaz fashioned forth that sleep in the shape of a luminous tall young man of 15. And he fashioned Geomar together with the bull from the earth. And from the light and turquoise color of the sky, he fashioned the semen of humans and cattle, as these two seeds are from fire, not from water. So my next story from the Shahnameh concerns the mythical bird, the Simurg, in Persian literature, with which I'm sure you're all familiar. In Zoroastrianism, this is the great Sena bird from mythology, referred to in Avestan and Pahlavi. I should just say, when I refer to Avestan, I'm sure you probably know this is the ancient language of the, of the prophet Zarathustra, not written down, but passed down in oral transmission, and finally um, committed to writing probably in the 6th century. So in keeping with an earlier um, uh, com composition. Th this this uh, picture here is of a of a stone um, simurg, and this has the 
it's not the Simurgh, sorry, it's the Senmurgh, the, the, the forerunner probably of the Simurgh, and it's um, a composite creature with a, with a canine head and probably peacock's tail, a fantastical beast. And the, um, this was then replaced, um, so we think, by the Simurgh, a far more elegant creature here, the bird. And this story in the Shahnameh is about Zal um, and his father, Sam. They were Zarka princes of Zabulistan in Sistan. And born with the of hair the color of moonlight, Zal was rejected by his father, abandoned in the mountains, and left to die. The baby was noticed by the Simurg, who carried him to her nest and reared him as her own, feeding him raw flesh instead of milk. When the news of Zal's survival reached his father's ears, the old king, propelled by a prophetic dream, went in search of his son. And bidding farewell to Zal, this is from the Simurg, let not thy heart forget to love thy nurse, for mine is breaking through my love of thee. And the Simurg then returns Zal to his father. And this um, picture shows the joyousness of the occasion with, with Zal riding on the back of the Simurg and holding onto her tail feathers for safety. And my final story from the Shahnameh is about the ordeal by fire. And this is a concept that probably goes back to Indo-Iranian times, before, before the advent of Zoroastrianism. And it's the story of, um, of Siawash. And the painting shows um, Siawash, the son of Kekavus, undergoing an ordeal by fire to prove his innocence, following the accusation by his stepmother, Sudabe, of violating her. He urges his horse into the flames and re-emerges, re as it says, with rosy cheeks and smiles upon his lips. And this, the fire ordeal took various forms. The only name I want you to remember is Rashnu the Judge, who is the divinity in Zoroastrianism, um, who's thought to have presided um, over, over the ordeal. There are, there are other um, instances, and I'm going to read you um, just a short extract from the um, Apathian epic, um, Vizuramin, which again, I'm sure you're, you're um, familiar with. But here, the old king Mobad, who suspects his wife, Viz, of having an affair with, with Ramin, um, decides that they should undergo the ordeal. And so he builds a huge um, pyre in, in the courtyard. It says here, he brought a flame lit from the temple fire to where his men had built a massive pyre. And as the sudden flame sprang up, they stood with aloe wood, musk, camphor, sandalwood to feed the blaze until it seemed to rise and be a partner of the turning skies. It was a golden dome, a wondrous sight that shook with incandescent flakes of light, a lovely woman in a crimson dress, strutting and roaring, wild with drunkenness, Splendid as she, as when she meets her love and burning with all the heat of separation's yearning. Filling the world with dazzling, brilliant light, banishing darkness and the shades of night. But men and women had no notion why the king had made these flames assault the sky. And it goes on. And then high on the palace roof, Viz and Ramin observed the fire and knew what it must mean. Look at the state of this pathetic man, V said. Isn't it obvious that his plan is that we'll perish on this flaming pyre? But why should we accede to his desire? Come on now, let's leave him here and let him be the one who burns in flames of jealousy. So they took to their heels, um, obviously being guilty. Um, so now I just want to... Um, uh, move on to the, the fact that these stories underpin this dualistic sense of good and evil, this dichotomy between the two. And it runs right through Zoroastrianism and can be identified in ideas and tropes in later literature. And it's associated in particular with death and the journey of the soul to the hereafter. Mm, we have the idea of the weighing of the good deeds against the bad. And this is a motif that continues to this day in our own, um, as well as in other cultures. So very briefly, this is um, an ossuary. Um, it's not completely irrelevant because I've 
taken out a little bit from the middle, which shows the soul in the form of a apparently a naked boy, though I'm not sure how we're meant to know, um, being his good and bad deeds are being held in two pans. And the divinity holding um, the scales in the balance is, is, is Rashnu, the judge. And so the good and bad deeds are being weighed before the, the soul proceeds to the Chinvat bridge, the bridge of the separator, um, where it will be met by its dana or, or conscience and its fate will be determined. If its good deeds have outweighed the bad, then the dana will appear in the form of a beautiful woman. A familiar image. If the other way round, it, the soul will be met by an ugly, stinking hag. <laughs> and this theme is picked up in, in a later Pahlavi book, 9th century book, called the Ardavirath Namag. Um, and this describes the journey of the soul of a righteous man, Ardavirath, around heaven and hell. And the purpose is to determine, this is obviously just 200 years um, or so, 300 years after the Islamic conquest of Iran and, and uh, Zoroastrian priests wanted to determine whether the religion was be still being um, practiced properly. So here we have um, Ardaviraf meeting the beautiful woman, the representation of its good behavior and good deeds. And again, we have Rashnu and, this, and, this, and the weighing scales um, for, the, for the weighing. Um, and then he arrives at the... Uh, this is having arrived at the bridge of the separator, and he, taking him around heaven and hell are two guides, Srosh, the divinity of hearkening and prayer, and Adabahisht, the um, protector of fire. And they're peeping there over the edge of the scene. And they then take him to show this river of tar and tears, which is actually hell. And so here you see the unfortunate soul um, falling off the bridge, the Chinvat bridge, into hell. And, of course, meeting the sum of his bad deeds, which is, as I said, this, this um, nasty, nasty hag. Um, so I've just got one more, um, a couple more images from here. So this is the book of the Ardaviraf Namag. And you can see here this, um, this unfortunate soul of a woman in hell being attacked by all sorts of nasty beasts and creepy crawlies. Her sin um, was being um, disobedient to her husband. <laughs> and here I juxtapose two folios because on the one hand you have the, the good wives who obey their husband's commands and on the other side you have the naughty ones. Um, as you might imagine, there are many more sins attributed to women um, than their male counterparts. Uh, but, um, in fact, punishments for adultery seems to, seem to have been fairly handed out quite equally to men and women. But just to finish um, on this theme, there are two more occasions which I thought might interest you to show how this story has, has travelled, so we think. So on the left is an image from a uniquely illustrated Persian manuscript of the Islamic Miraj Nameh. And here the prophet Muhammad, mounted on his horse, Burak, beholds the gates of hell. And the women you see there have been strung up their punishment for committing adultery. And then on the right-hand side, in a similar vein um, to the Ardaviraf Namag, we have a, a 14th century copy of, of Dante Alighieri's Divine Comedy. And this shows Dante with his, with his guide, Virgil, witnessing naked themes thieves who are being tormented by snakes and the one on the right sort of consumed with burning fire the only difference between um, these images Christian and Islamic is that of course in Zoroastrianism hell has no fire it's just a very bitterly cold place foul smelling um, so I'm now going to end but perhaps not on this grisly note just one final image is of the cockerel representing Srausha, Srosh, um, as I said, the divinity of hearkening and prayer. So on the left, the Miraj Nameh shows the ascent of prophet from Jerusalem through the seven heavens, which draws on Zoroastrian, Jewish and Christian apocalyptic traditions. And then we have the white cockerel, Khrush, which is quite
quite unusual to have in this Islamic text. Um, the prophet is informed by his guide, Gabriel, that this is the cockerel that keeps track of the hours of day and night, whereby people on earth are reminded of the time for prayer. Mm. Exactly the same role as that of the cockerel in the Zoroastrian tradition. So thank you very much. We can just leave it like that. Thank you very much, Sarah. The themes that you touched upon, obviously those of you familiar with passion poetry, all world poetry, run through uh, so many of our heroic and romantic epics and so many of our didactic, you know, mirrors for princes, whether, you know, it's the Gulistan of Sa'di or uh, so many of the spiritual epics. Um, the idea of good and evil, and I suppose so much of Islamic idea of um, Amr bi Ma'roof and Nahi as Munkar, and so closely interwoven. The birds that I wanted to pick out from Sarah's uh, uh, images was of course Seymour, this extraordinary mythical part human, part um, foul creature that um, uh, uh, soars and dives and carries on flying throughout our literature from very early 10th century Persian poetry that began to be written in Persian language to in the classical era and all the way to modern uh, compositions. And of course, the most significant uh, epic, the spiritual long narrative poem that we have is Mantegotir, the conference or speech of the birds of Attar, a, a 12th century, about 1170, it was written. And of course, the hero, the guide of the poem is Hud Hud, the hoopoe. And Attar starts with, doesn't it start actually, comes fairly halfway through the poem, and it says, Marhabo, a Hud Hude Hadi Shude, Dar Hagigat Peke Har Vodi Shude. ای به سر حد سبا سیر تو خوش با سلیمان منطق تیر تو خوش صاحب اسرار سلیمان آمدی از تفاخر تاج ورزان آمدی and of course in منطق تیر I'm so conscious of so many experts sitting here that I don't want to really uh, punch above my weight but bear with my faux pas as I said, the Pogis, the birds said, we need our own leader. We need our own king. And the Hupu uh, said, OK, I can show you the path. I know I'm the confidant of Suleiman, and I speak, um, uh, and, and, and I'm privy to so many secrets. And it is him who takes a select group of birds, and some fall by the wayside. And they eventually ask him that, well, you know, where are we? going exactly, uh, those who had passed the initial test. And one of those birds, Digari goftash ke ei dana ye rah, dide mi gardad dar in vadi siyah, por siyasat mi namayad in tariq, chand farsang ast in rah ei rafiq. Goft ma ra haft vadi dar rah ast, chon gozashti, Haft vadi dar gahast. Baz nayad dar jahan zin rah kas. Nist as farsang on agah kas. Hast vadi ye talab agaz kar. Vadi ye ishq ast zan pas bi kenar. Pas seyum vadi ist az an ma'rifat. Hast charum vadi ye استقنا صفت هست پنجم وادی توحید پاک پس ششم وادی حیرت صعبناک هفتمین وادی فقر است و فنا بعد از این وادی روش نبود تو را برکشش افتی روش گم گرددد گر بود یک قطره قلزم گرددد so if you Forgive my reading of it. This is Dick Davis's amazing translation. Penguin Classics, I think, isn't it? 
before another bird said hoopoo you can find the way from here but we're almost blind the path seems full of terrors and despair dear hoopoo how much further till we are there before we reach our goal the hoopoo said the journey's seven valleys lie ahead again this re-emergence of number seven that sarah also um, highlighted how far this is the world has never learned, for no one who has gone there has returned. Impatient bird, who would retrace this trail? There is no messenger to tell the tale. The first stage is the valley of quest. Then love's wide valley is our second test. The third is insight into mystery. The fourth, detachment and serenity. The fifth is unity, the sixth is awe, a deep bewilderment unknown before. The seventh, poverty, poverty and nothingness. And there you are suspended, motionless, till you are drawn, the impulse is not yours, a drop absorbed in seas that have no shores. I want you, if you can, remember this, which we will revisit in our modern uh, piece. So on this journey, who would I trust to take us through, just give us glimpses of the magic is, is, that is this vast um, several centuries of the classical Persian poetry? I can trust no one better than my very own hood hood, my hoopoo, Bruce Clark. <laughs> Um, Bruce Wano. Bruce, um, uh, we agreed that I have held back on his biography. I introduced him really very insufficiently as a traveller and linguist. And the reason is that I think we will encounter some of his other attributes and some of his passions uh, through his selections of poetry. Bruce Wano, ladies and gentlemen. Well, thank you very much for coming, and thank you for making it possible, um, Dr. Ziba and Nargis and other friends. Um, we're all on a journey. We journey from youth to old age. We journey uh, physically. We journey between cultures. We learn and we forget. One friend who, alas, is now dead, a man who wrote poetry in English, in Arabic, and in French, Glenn Canbath Paul, told me once, no experience is complete for me until I've written a poem about it. And <clears throat> I think, as we'll see later in the modern poetry, um, sometimes poetry can encapsulate experience as sometimes protest, sometimes memory, sometimes internal history, sometimes the continuation of a tradition. And I think poetry in any country is the crystallization of language and emotion and experience. Um, Shakespeare, in one of his sonnets, said something that I often think of when we look at modern politics filled with hatred and violence and injustice. And yet, culture and beauty can always stand with a quiet voice to provide an alternative to the narratives of hatred and violence and separation. Shakespeare said, how with this rage shall beauty hold a plea whose action is no stronger than a flower. Beauty, even if it is no stronger than a flower, is always pleading for an alternative to narratives of hatred and violence and forgetfulness and erosion by time. Once I was with some friends in the garden of Dolat Abad in Yazd, and we had a wonderful young Iranian guide. And as often in Persian gardens, 
it's the moment to read Saadi or Hafez or Rumi or Iraqi or other poets. And I asked this guide, why is it that for Persian people, poetry seems to be so important? Because wherever we went in Iran, people would co quote poetry and they would use it to clinch an argument. They would use it in proverbs. They would use it to enrich their conversation. And the fact that I know some poetry, which I've learned largely from my Persian-speaking friends, whether Iranian or Afghan or Central Asian, um, I've learned while traveling so much from the generosity and the hospitality of the people of the Persian and cultural world. This guy had turned to us and said, you know, in Iran, we've been invaded so often. Our society has been devastated by violent, either civil war, invasions from abroad, collapse, natural calamity. So much of our built heritage, so much of our art collections, so much of our social elite, so much of our social structures, our traditions, have repeatedly been smashed and destroyed. What has never, ever been taken from us is the Persian language and the crystallization of the Persian language in poetry. This intangible cultural heritage we hold on to because it is something that has never been taken from us and cannot be taken from us. And I think that is a key, perhaps, to this wonderful continuing tradition. And it is a continuing tradition. You meet poetry wherever you go in the Persian-speaking world. And remember that the Persian-speaking world has always been much vaster than the political limits of Iran today. Now, you need some water. Well, we'll get the wine afterwards. Um, as was already mentioned, um, for many Westerners, the entrance into this world of Persian poetry is the translations that were done, some in English um, going back uh, quite a way, certainly Sir William Jones in the 18th century, who first um, propounded the theory of Indo-European languages in a speech in the 1780s to the Bengal Asiatic Society. Um, linking Persian, Russian, Greek, Latin, French, Welsh. He was Welsh. Uh, he was a judge in the High Court in Calcutta. Um, <clears throat> but also, notably, Goethe, um, when he encountered the translations of Josef von Hammer Poakstal, uh, who was the court translator of Ottoman Turkish, but also of Persian for the court in Vienna and was ennobled uh, for his services. Um, he translated selections of Oriental literature, um, which Goethe read and transmuted into this beautiful um, divan of his own German poetry called the Westöstliche Divan, um, some of which was set to music later by Schubert and Schumann. Um, and I was lucky enough to have a wonderful tutor at Oxford who introduced us to, to this. And <clears throat> that made me determined to find out more about uh, Persian literature. And um, so I went to teach in Isfahan uh, in the autumn of 1978, um, <clears throat> which was a, an interesting time to be in Iran. Um, and a poem we will come across in a few moments uh, when Nargis reads it, was the first poem that I was taught by my students, um, Sohrab Sepehri's Khani Dust Kojast, Where is my friend's house? I'm sure any Iranians in the audience will know this poem very well. Um, <clears throat> also, a friend, Shirin uh, Dehkani Tafti, who was a, a fellow teacher at Isfahan University, introduced me to the passage from the Mantekotair that Nargis has, has just read about the journey across the seven valleys of. Um, initiation into deeper and deeper aspects of the spiritual journey. When I went to India, um, 
to renew my visa. It's from university had forgotten ever to get me a visa. So every three months I had to go and, um, outside the country and come back with a new tourist visa. So I took the chance to go and swim in the lake at Pushkar in Rajasthan, where I met an Iranian traveler who taught me my first two uh, quatrains of Khayyam. Um, and of course, one, now that I'm 67, is uh, still very relevant. Afsus ke name javani te shod. Van taze bahar zindigani de shod. Hali ke vera naam javani gofte and malum na shod ke ke amado ke shod. Alas, the scroll of youth is rolled up, finished. This tender, fresh springtime of life has turned into dry winter. That moment we called youth. We never realized when it came or when it went. The other poem this young Iranian taught me at the Lake of Pushkar was something I often remember when I travel, if I'm getting tired and haven't reached the end of the day um, with somewhere to sleep, which has happened to me on occasions when I've ridden across um, Afghanistan on horseback. E kash ke jay aramidan budi. Ya in rahi dur ra residan budi. Ya az pas sad hezar sal, az yire چون سبزه امید بردمیدن بودی. Now, <clears throat> this which casts doubt on the certainty of the resurrection is one of the reasons why Ahun's, the clergy, only pick up Khayyam with Amvor, with um, fire tongs. <clears throat> <laughs> if only there were somewhere to rest. If only there were an end to this endless road. If only after 100,000 years under the earth, like the grass, we could hope to spring to life again. Nature promises new life to seeds, the grass. But Hayam doubted about the certainty of that for himself. Now, <clears throat> I was lucky enough to visit Shiraz um, at the beginning of the revolution. I was actually in Persepolis and came back and the taxi driver at the Darwazi Quran said, I'm not going any further. There was a pall of black smoke over Shiraz and it had just been taken over by the revolutionary guards and they were burning a lot of, uh, of car tires having taken the, the barracks with the arms. And so we walked through um, the crowd who were perfectly friendly. I mean, it didn't matter that we were English and it was a revolutionary crowd. Um, they were their hospitable Iranian selves, um, though they were angry in other ways. Um, but we went to Hafiz's tomb on that visit. And when I came back to England and spent the early 1980s in England, I would visit the, my ex-colleague, uh, Shirin Dehkani Tafti, and her father, who'd been Bishop of Isfahan, and one day I was present in, in Wimbledon where we had regular Masnavi readings with Dr. Masoud Homayuni, of blessed memory. And before starting the, the com his commentaries on the Masnavi, we all took Fal of Hafez, the bishop whose only son had been ambushed and murdered in Tehran on his way to teach at the university. And I had to bring his corpse back from Behesh to uh, to Isfahan, the bishop opened Hafez at random. Um, this taking a file of, of um, a prognostication from Hafez is something that is widespread as a social habit among Persian speakers. And I personally have experience that really makes me believe that Hafez deserves his title of Lisan ul Ghaib, the tongue of the unknown. So Bishop Dirkani Tafti, who'd lost his only son, who had narrowly escaped an assassination attempt. I was going to play tennis with his son Bahram and his daughter Shirin one morning, went to the bishop's palace, uh, walking along the road, went 
in and um, saw the bedroom which was full, pitted with gunfire. Um, the uh, Revolutionary Guards had come to the door of his bedroom and had emptied a few Kalashnikovs worth. Um, Margaret, his wife, had thrown herself over the bishop. Her hand was smashed, but the bishop was alive even though his pillow and bed were full of bullet holes. He was whisked out of the country that night, which is why eventually they murdered his son. Anyway, he had suffered a lot. Um, he opened our fairs, and <clears throat> in the salon in Wimbledon, this is what we heard. Ma bedindar na pey heshmat o ja amadeim. As bad a hadesi in ja be panah amadeim. We didn't come here looking for glory or honor. It was the dreadful events there that drove us to seek ref refuge here. But of course, Hafez always takes you on other, deeper journeys than merely your personal questions. And another of the verses in this poem is the beautiful line, Rah roi manzele eshkim, vas sarhade adam, tabe eklime vujud, in hamera amadeim. We are travelers going on the various stages of love. And we've come all this way from the furthest boundaries of non-being to this place where we exist here and now. Now, in my own experience, I found some files from Hafez, some of these, you open, you think, you place a question, you open the Divan of Hafez at random. You're not looking it opens, and then you take what he tells you. I was due to do some surveying and um, controlling of aid work to civilian communities in Afghanistan during the Russian invasion. Um, it was my first trip. I was a little bit uh, uncertain as to what would happen. Um, when I'd lived in Iran teaching at the university uh, up from 78 to 1980, um, my students called me Behruz. Um, the Afghans couldn't pronounce Behruz, so they often pronounce it Biruz, and I said, no, no, Biruz means uh, unfortunate rather than lucky. <laughs> so let's make it into Firuz or Piruz. So the Afghans knew me as Firuz, and the Irans knew me as Behruz. And I asked, before setting off into the, the relative wilderness of Afghanistan, um, Hafez for a file, and this is what came. Bisahraro. Yes, Daman, Hobar, Hobar, Ram, Biafshani, Begulzar, I, Kaz Bulbul, Razal Goftan, Biamuzi. To Imkani Hulud, a del, that in Firuze Avon, Nist, Majale Aish, for Satan, Be Firuzi, Ba Behruzi. So, Hafez answered me in both my names. He said, go to these dusty plains. Shake off the dust of grief and sadness. Go to the rose garden and learn from the nightingale how to sing. There's no possibility, no security of tenure under these sky blue vaults. Take what is given to you of life, whether you are Behruz or Firuz. <laughs> so I felt he was really answering me, and I went and traveled in Afghanistan and came back, um, and I'm still here. Um, <laughs> another time, I was in Baluchistan. It was late spring. Um, I was due to fly somewhere. And as my, is my habit, I took a file of Hafez. And um, I'll just read you the short line. Nemi de hand ejazat mara. Basically, the weather is not going to allow you to travel. And that night, there was a freak snowstorm which closed Quetta Airport. But I was not able to travel. And Hafez yet again got it absolutely spot on. So, I mean, obviously, Hafez is much greater, wider, deeper than just mining him for, as it were, 
consolation or reassurance um, in the tribulations of life. But it's certainly a wonderful, um, much more than just a society game. It's much more than just reading your future in coffee cups, which Armenian girls do in Tehran and usually tell you very rude things that they, they see in the coffee cups, but wouldn't be able, as well-bred girls, to tell you otherwise. Um, when I went to work with Afghans, I was based in Peshawar, though on several occasions um, I went either by motorcycle or by horse across the country looking at civilian programs. And I met many Afghans uh, who treasure the classical Persian poetic tradition. Um, Afghanistan, Tajikistan, the cities of Central Asia, Iran, they all share this great tradition. And it's a basis of unity rather than of division. And whatever political or religious differences there might be in sectarianism or extremism, that's something never to be forgotten. And a lot of my Afghan friends taught me different things. Um, there was once, um, on one of my first trips, I was up in the mountains near Jalalabad at Jigdalek with um, a commander of the Mujahideen called Anwar. And he was a pahlavan, he was a wrestler, he would res wrestled for Afghanistan in the Olympics, and he was a big, burly man. But he had a soft center, and one of his favorite poems was by um, a late uh, poet from Bafk near Yaz called Vahshi. His poet poet poetic name was, was Vahshi. And um, we'd been eating white mulberries off the trees and drinking shlomle, which is the Persian version of a sort of dour. And we spent the evening listening to Anwar reciting this very long poem. I'll just give you the first couple of verses. Dustan, sharh parishani man, gush konid. Dustan eram pinhani man, gush konid. Qesse bi saro samani man, gush konid. گفت گوی و من و حیرانی من گوش کنید شرح این آتش جانسوز نگفتن تا که سوختم سوختم این راز نهفتن تا که oh my friends listen to how I expand to you my desperate confusion listen to the story of my hidden grief listen to the tale of my helpless madness my words my astonishment, listen. How long should I hold back from telling you this soul-burning love? I burn, I burn. How long should I hide this secret? Another Afghan asked me once to translate to send to what he hoped would be his girlfriend in Canada, um, a beautiful poem of Molana, um, from the Divan Shams, um, which was also sung by um, some of the popular singers in Kabul. Pushide chun jan, mi ravi andar mian e jan e man, sarve khiramal ne mani, e ronak e bostan e man. Chun mi ravi bi man maro, e jan e jan, bi tan maro. از چشم من بیرون مشو ای مشعل تابان من هفت آسمان را بردارم و از هفت دریا بگذرم چون دل برانه بنگری در جان سرگردان من تا آمدی اندر برم شد کفر و ایمان چاکرم ای دیدن تو دین من و ای روی تو ایمان من از لطف تو چون جان شدم و از خیشتن پنهان شدم ای هستی تو پنهان شده در هستی پنهان من hidden like the spirit you slip into my soul you are my waving cypress the splendor of my garden when you withdraw do not go without me O oh, quintessential spirit do not go without the body do not vanish from my sight, O oh my blazing glory. 
When you glance so lovingly at my distracted soul, I swim the seven seas, I fly the seven skies. When you come into my embrace, both faith and denial are enslaved. To see you is my faith. Your lovely face is my religion. I am spiritualized through your grace, hidden from myself, and in my hidden self is blended your subtle being. Now, of course, this can be read as the most beautiful love poem, and it's very sensual, but it has a whole spiritual dimension, and sometimes it helps also to think of the circumstances in which a poem was written, unless one is tempted to read it too literally as an erotic love poem, it was actually composed when Molana was attending his beloved son-in-law, Salah Dean, who married one of his daughters, who predeceased Molana, and it was written at his deathbed. So what Molana is talking about is spiritual friendship, even though the language is so rich that could easily be interpreted also as a sensual love poem. So the polyvalence of the Persian poetic tradition is something always to be aware of. Now, my main discovery from my Afghan friends was a poet who represents the complex uh, Sab Kehendi style, uh, Mirza Abdul Qadir Bidel, who was from a Turkish family of soldiers in the Mughal army, and then retired to become the philosopher, Sufi, and poet in Delhi, and is um, very much inspired by the um, Safi poet Saib, Saib Tabrizi from Isfahan. Um, but he's, some of his poems are sung by Afghan singers, and he has actually a great reputation in Tajikistan and in Central Asia as well. Probably slightly less in Iran, though Shafi Kadkani did write a beautiful good book called uh, Shair e Aineha uh, about Bidel. But something really sticks with me about this slightly abstruse but very beautiful imagery of this Ghazal by Bidel. Ranj e zindagi bar ma nisti gwara kard. Zin mohit bugzashtan dar nazar. می کشد از ایران را از قیامت آن سوتر شاهد عمل بیدل ترفه کا کلی دارد In the translation by my friend uh, at least the poetic translation um, which we did together uh, Robert Maxwell and I produced a small book in 2011 of poems um, he translates it thus the prospect of non-being, Nisti, helps us swallow life's suffering, Ranges in the To keep to escape this imprisoning world, a virtual bridge can take us hence. Beyond even resurrection, we prisoners are led, Bidel, by that beautiful youth hope and his provocative loveliness. And I think hope is something we must never give up on our journey. Thank you very much. Dare I even attempt to continue? But we promised to end on a um, note of contemporary poet. And I'll in order to save time, I won't go through the long... You know, I, I, I've got to introduce myself. My name is Nargis Farzat, and I teach Persian here. <laughs> I'm a senior fellow in Persian, and I wear another hat as the current um, chair of Center for Iranian Studies. And I do have a habit of treating the audience as my students, so I'll stop now and go straight to this poem. Um, I've chosen two poems for you. One, as Bruce John mentioned, is the very famous um, Neshani in Persian um, by Sohrab Seferi, an extraordinary poet, a painter, a poet, a thinker. 
um, and a very good writer who very sadly died at the age of 52 in about 1980. An extraordinary man. And um, his uh, complete works are in Hashed Kitov, seven books. <coughs> And the poem, uh, Nishani, is sandwiched between two other poems, Peyram e Mahiha and Hichestan. And we often read Nishani on its own, but it really is a conversation. It's a sort of a call and response uh, poem between the poetic voice and the divine that he is trying to seek. And um, I then follow with one uh, other po poem by Fatima Shams, who I absolutely and beholden to an extraordinary young uh, uh, female poet and first-class scholar who we have sadly lost in this country. She now is in Philadelphia, teaches there, and I love her poems. So Bruce and Sarah are going to help me with the translations. So if I get my um, uh, poems together. So first, Peyram e Mahiha. Rafte budam sare hoz, ta bebinam shayad عکس تنهایی خود را در آب آب در حوز نبود ماهیان می گفتند هیچ تقصیر درختان نیست ظهر دم کرده تابستان بود پسر روشن آب لب پاشویه نشست و عقاب خورشید آمد او را به هوا برد که برد تو اگر در تپش باغ خدا را دیدی همت کن و بگو ماهی ها حوزشان بی آب است باد می رفت به سر وقت چنار من به سر وقت خدا می رفتم So Bruce John, would you read that opening before I go so we don't lose the audience who don't speak Persian so The message is this, can you hear me? The message of the goldfish. I had gone to the garden pond to catch a glimpse of my loneliness reflected in the water, but there was hardly any in the pond. The fishes said, It's not the fault of the trees. Summer's noon was boiling hot. Water's shimmering child was playing where the water slides over the edge. The sun, eagle like, dived, caught it, lifted it into the air, high and far away. If you see God in the heartbeat of the garden, dare to tell him the fish, their pond is empty. The breeze went off to call on the plane tree and I to call on God. رهگذر شاخه نوری که به لب داشت به تاریکی شنها بخشید و به انگشت نشان داد سپیداری و گفت نرسیده به درخت کوچه باقی است که از خواب خدا سبزتر است و در آن عشق به اندازه پرهای صداقت آبی است می روی تا ته آن کوچه که از پشت بلوغ سر به در می آرد. پس به سمت گل تنهایی می پیچی دو قدم مانده به گل پای فواره جاوید اساتیر زمین می مانی و تو را ترسی شفاف فرا می گیرد. در سمیمیت سیال فضا خشخشی می شنوی. کودکی میبینی رفته از کاج بلندی بالا جوجه بردارد از لانه نور و از او میپرسی خانه دوست کجاست Asking the way Where is the house of my friend It was dawn when the rider asked the sky stood still. The bystander threw the stub of light from his lips onto the darkness of the sand and pointing to a white poplar said, before you reach the tree, there is a lane between the orchards greener than God's sleeping dream. There, love is blue as the feathers of sincerity. 
exactly to the end of that lane. As it emerges beyond the end of childhood, then turn towards the rose of solitude. Two steps before reaching that rose, stop. At the foot of the eternal fountain of Earth's age-old story, you will be flooded with luminous fear in the overwhelming intimacy of that space. You will hear a rustling sound. You will see a child who has climbed a tall pine tree lift a fledgling from the nest of light. Ask him, where is the house of my friend? Bruce and I had great fun a few hours ago sitting outside in the <coughs> sunshine trying to polish up that translation. When <laughs> Whenever I read that poem, and I think quite appropriate on the 4th of July, that I always think of Raymond Carver's amazing poem, Waiting. And I thought I'd just read a bit of it, just see how close the poets are. They, they just have a language of their own. They communicate. Of course, Raymond Carver died um, uh, after Sefehri, and I have no idea that he would have ever heard this poem. Left off the highway and down the hill, at the bottom, hang another left, keep bearing left. The road will make a Y, left again. There is a creek on the left, keep going. Just before the road ends, there will be another road. Take it and no other. Otherwise, your life will be ruined forever. There is a log house with a shake roof on the left. It's not that house, it's the next house, just over a rise. The house where trees are laden with fruit, where flocks for scythia and marigold grow. It's the house where the woman stands in the doorway, wearing the sun in her hair. The one who's been waiting all this time. The woman who loves you. The one who can say, what kept you? <laughs> so again. Yeah. And then, so I broke the um, uh, chain, so he uh, has gone off looking for God. And I think this is where the sort of response and call comes. And the next, the third poem in this trilogy. Mm. پر قاصد ها ایست که خبر می آرند از گل با شده دورترین بوته خاک تا نسیم اتشی در بن برگی بدود زنگ باران به صدا می آید به سراغ من اگر می آید نرم و آهسته بیایید مبادا که ترک بردارد چینی if you call by to see me, I live on the far side of nowhere land. In nowhere land, there is a place where the veins of air are filled with dandelion seed heads, bringing news of buds as they open on rose bushes far away. In nowhere land, a waft of thirst runs down the leaf veins. Immediately, bells of rain start ringing. If you come <coughs> calling by to see me, come softly, come slowly, lest you crack the fine porcelain of my solitude. And what does that remind you of? W. B. Yeats, <coughs> I have spread my dreams under your feet. Tread softly, or you, th you tread on my dreams. And I forgot to grab my book off. So we finished with... Um, Couldn't get my cotton. Oh, here we are. It's extraordinary. I uh, wholly uh, recommend you or urge you um, to read Fatima Shams's poetry. Her time is... Um, you know, from uh, when she started um, writing her poems in the past, um, to publish them, I imagine she's ri written them all her life, 
but publishing she started probably in the ne in the last 15 years or so so a very turbulent period in the life of a young student in Iran who then she came over here and I wouldn't go on about her but one of the poems that really really it hits you just in the stomach but it also adheres to this a tradition of ghazal writing, the lyrical ode that is as popular as ever. And Sarah will read the English for you. Darro ke shekastand, darro gushe to budam. Lolo iye sarmo zade dar gushe to budam. Darro ke shekastand, maro sacht feshordi. Dar on shabe vahshat zade. تن پوش تو بودم زیر لگد و فوش تو اوریان و من اوریان خونا به چکان تن بیهوش تو بودم افتادی و آرام نگاه تو فرو ریخت انگار که صد سال فراموش تو بودم وقتی که تو را بردند یک نقمه قمگین وقتی که تو را بردند یک نقمه غمگین دریای پریهای خاموش تو بودم یک بغز ترک خورده آرام میان پرونده تا خورده و مخدوش تو بودم هرچند تو را دار کشیدند عزیزم در حافظه عکس هماغوش تو بودم when they broke down the door. When they broke down the door, I was in your arms like a freezing cold lullaby curled in your ear. When they broke down the door, you gripped me tightly. I was the clothes on your body on that night filled with fear. Beneath their kicks and their curses, you were naked. I was naked. I was your body, dripping blood, unconscious. My darling, you fell and your calm gaze faltered and failed, as though I was something you'd forgotten in years gone by. When they took you, I was grief-stricken. Cry a silent sea where your fabulous creatures appear. I was a sadness cracked open, calm in the midst of the file that was folded now, smudged and then erased. And though they have hanged you, in memory's image I see myself there, still in your arms, my darling. Thank you, Sarah. And the translation is by Dick Davis um, in this, um, uh, the book is called When They Broke Down the Door. Now I'm very conscious that we are 10 minutes at least into drinking time. So I don't know what they were doing. Do you think, should we leave it there? Should we leave without our questions? And then just go and mingle. We can carry on and talking over a glass of wine. So I want um, you to join me to say a huge thank you first to Ziva John for having the idea of this. And an absolute can-do attitude, which I have, I hope I have learned at your feet. But more um, importantly, thanking our uh, two amazing contributors, Sarah Stewart and Bruce Wannell. <laughs> and last but not least, thank you so much for being such an amazing audience and come, giving up on such a lovely evening to come and join us. Come and see us again. Thank you. Thank you.